Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to be continuing to read The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. So, let's get going. Chapter 17 A Tantrum She had got up very early in the morning and had worked hard in the garden, and she was tired and sleepy. So, as soon as Martha had brought her supper, and she had eaten it, she was glad to go to bed. As she laid her head on the pillow, she murmured to herself, I'll go out before breakfast and work with Dickon, and then afterward, I believe, I'll go to see him. She thought it was the middle of the night when she was awakened by such dreadful sounds that she jumped out of bed in an instant. What was it? What was it? The next minute she felt quite sure she knew. Doors were opened and shut, and there were hurrying feet in the corridors, and someone was crying and screaming at the same time, screaming and crying in a horrible way. It's Colin, she said. He's having one of those tantrums, the nurse called hysterics. How awful it sounds. As she listened to the sobbing screams, she did not wonder that people were so frightened that they gave him his own way in everything rather than hear them. She put her hands over her ears and felt sick and shivering. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, she kept saying. I can't bear it. Once she wondered if he would stop if she dared to go to him. And then she remembered how he had driven her out of the room and thought that perhaps the sight of her might make him worse. Even when she pressed her hands more tightly over her ears, she could not keep the awful sounds out. She hated them so, and was so terrified by them, that suddenly they began to make her angry, and she felt as if she should like to fly into a tantrum herself, and frighten him as he was frightening her. She was not used to anyone's tempers but her own. She took her hands from her ears and sprang up and stamped her foot. He ought to be stopped. Somebody ought to make him stop. Somebody ought to beat him, she cried out. Just then she heard feet almost running down the corridor, and a door was opened and the nurse came in. She was not laughing now by any means. She even looked rather pale. He's worked himself into hysterics, she said in a great hurry. He'll do himself harm. No one can do anything with him. You come and try like a good child. He likes you. He turned me out of the room this morning, said Mary, stamping her foot with excitement. The stamp rather pleased the nurse. The truth was that she had been afraid she might find Mary crying and hiding her head under the bedclothes. That's right, she said. You're in the right humour. You go and scold him. Give him something new to think of. Do go, child, as quick as ever you can. It was not until afterward that Mary realised that the thing had been funny as well as dreadful. That it was funny that all the grown-up people were so frightened that they came to a little girl just because they guessed she was almost as bad as Colin himself. She flew along the corridor, and the nearer she got to the screams, the higher her temper mounted. She felt quite wicked by the time she reached the door. She slapped it open with a hand and ran across the room to the four-posted bed. You stop, she almost shouted. You stop, I hate you. Everybody hates you. I wish everybody would run out of the house and let you scream yourself to death. You'll scream yourself to death in a minute, and I wish you would. A nice sympathetic child could neither have thought nor said such things, but it just happened that the shock of hearing them was the best possible thing for this hysterical boy, whom no one had ever dared to restrain or contradict. He had been lying on his face beating his pillow with his hands, and he actually almost jumped around. He turned so quickly at the sound of the furious little voice. His face looked dreadful white and red and swollen, and he was gasping and choking. But savage little Mary did not care an atom. If you scream another scream, she said, I'll scream too, and I can scream louder than you can, and I'll frighten you, I'll frighten you. He actually had stopped screaming because she had startled him so. The scream which had been coming almost choked him. The tears were streaming down his face and he shook all over. I can't stop, he gasped and stop, sobbed. I can't, I can't. You can, shouted Mary. Half the tales you is hysterics and temper. 
Just hysterics, hysterics, hysterics. And she stamped each time she said it. I felt the lump. I felt it, choked out Colin. I knew I should. I shall have a hunch on my back and then I shall die. And he began to writhe again and turned on his face and sobbed and wailed. But he didn't scream. You didn't feel a lump, contradicted Mary fiercely. If you did, it was only a hysterical lump. Hysterics make lumps. There's nothing the matter with your horrid back. Nothing but hysterics. Turn over and let me look at it. She liked the word hysterics and felt somehow as if it had an effect on him. He was probably, probably like herself and had never heard it before. Nurse, she commanded, come here and show me his back this minute. The nurse, Mrs. Medlock and Martha had been standing huddled together near the door, staring at her, their hot mouths half open. All three had gasped with fright more than once. The nurse came forward as if she were half afraid. Colin was heaving with great breathless sobs. Perhaps he, he won't let me, she hesitated in a low voice. Colin heard her, however, and he gasped out between two sobs. Sh show her. She'll, she'll see then. then. It was a poor thin back to look at when, oops, when it was bared. Every rib could be counted and every joint on the, of the spine, though Mary Mistress did not count them as she bent over and examined them with a solemn savage little face. She looked so sour and old-fashioned that the nurse turned her head aside to hide the twitching of her mouth. There was just a minute's silence, for even Colin tried to hold his breath while Mary looked up and down his spine, and down and up as intently as if she had been the great doctor from London. There's not a single lump there, she said at last. There's not a lump as big as a pin, except backbone lumps, and you can only feel them because you're thin. I've got backbone lumps myself, and they used to stick out as much as yours do, until I began to get fatter, and I am not fat enough yet to hide them. There's not a lump as big as a pin. If you ever say there is again, I shall laugh. No one but Colin himself knew what effect those crossly spoken, childish words had on him. If he had ever had anyone talk to talk to about his secret terrors, if he had ever dared to let himself ask questions, if he had had childish companions that had, and had not lain on his back in the huge closed house, breathing an atmosphere heavy with the fears of people who were most of them ignorant and tired of him, he would have found out that most of his fright and illness was created by himself. But he had lain and thought of himself and his aches and weariness for hours and days and months and years, and now that an angry unsympathetic little girl insisted obstinately that he was not as ill as he thought he was, he actually felt as if she might be speaking the truth. I didn't know, ventured the nurse, that he thought he had a lump on his spine. His back is weak because he won't try to sit up. I could have told him there was no lump there. Colin gulped and turned his face a little to look at her. C could you? he said pathetically. Yes, sir. There, said Mary, and she gulped too. Colin turned on his face again, and but for his long-drawn broken breaths, which were the dying down of his storm of sobbing, he lay, he lay still for a minute, though great tears streamed down his face and wet the pillow. Actually, the tears meant that a curious great relief had come to him. Presently he turned and looked at the nurse again, and strangely enough, he was not like a Raja at all as he spoke to her. Do you think I could live to grow up? he said. The nurse was neither clever nor soft-hearted, but she could repeat some of the London doctor's words. And with that, we actually are going to come to the end of the reading, because uh, as per usual, we don't have time for another page in the grand scheme of things. Um, I actually didn't see what page we were on. Um, I think we're over halfway now. I'm just going to double check that quickly. I'm pretty sure we're over halfway. Oh, we're well over halfway now. So yeah. Um, I am going to say though, thank you very much for joining me today. 
Um, I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night, no matter what time of day it is. I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye. <laughs>